All right. We're here today with Matthias Meyer, formerly of Travis CI. How are you doing? I'm doing well, Garrett. Thank you. How awesome. are you? I am fantastic. Um, so can you give us a little background on your history, how you got to where you are, um, and what you're working on now, what's kind of coming down the pipe, what you're looking forward to in the near future? Yeah, absolutely. So as you know, as Garrett already said, I'm a former co-founder and former CEO of Travis CI, a company that's, you know, headquartered here in Berlin in Germany. Um, it was my second startup already, which I spent about six years, uh, six years on. I joined as an engineer uh, and quickly evolved towards, you know, focusing more on the business side and eventually moved into the role of CEO and over the six years, grew the company and business to our, uh, to 50 people um, and about 5,000 customers in total. Um, but yeah, these uh, six years are always hard to summarize in just a short, uh, in just a short rundown for a couple of minutes. Um, I left the company earlier this year uh, and since then have been, I you know, introduced myself to people as kind of a free radical where I talk to different companies and people and, you know, poke, uh, poke into hornet's nests here and there to see what comes out. So you could also call me a consultant uh, or coach or mentor for engineering leaders, for startup executives. And I also work with, you know, growing engineering organizations right now to help them navigate challenges in leadership management roles, but also in growing their teams or just the, you know, the general challenges of any growing company and engineering team. As, as teams move beyond, say, the initial two or three co-founders or early employees. Right on. And Travis was effectively almost entirely remote, right? Uh, yes. I mean, we, we do have, uh, or the company does have an office, which is, you know, basically I could almost, it's five minutes, five minutes from, from where I live. Um, but we, uh, we focus a lot on building a distributed company, so not just remote, you know, in the sense of that we're not all located in the same office, but that, you know, many employees are spread out across the globe. Mm-hmm. And it's spanned pretty much from here, Berlin, uh, to, to the U.S. West Coast. And sometimes there were other time zones involved, depending on who might be where. But yeah, the split is about maybe a little bit more than 50% of the company are remote. And even people who you know, work from the office are never required to work there. It's just a place that you can choose to work from. Yeah, it's kind of the same way at Wildbit, where about half the team's in Philly. And even them, they don't always go into the office. And then the other half of us are spread out um, from, see, I guess Serbia is the farthest, your direction. And then all the way to, uh, obviously, the West Coast here. Um, mm-hmm. So we've got kind of that same spread and you just kind of have to embrace the time zone challenges yes. and that's just part of it. Um, so you're no longer with Travis, uh, mm-hmm. obviously a founder leaving a company, um, let alone the CEO is never something that's easy. Uh, to, you know, it's not an easy decision. It's not easy to transition, pull off. Um, can you talk a little bit about that experience, anything you learned um, and kind of how that unfolded as much as you want to, share or not share is totally fine yeah absolutely um so the decision itself uh the decision to leave eventually it wasn't one that you know was easy to make obviously after putting in six years of you know pretty much everything um uh you know early on just you know entire days weekends and then over time just you know changing with the company it's never an easy thing to do to just say you know to move to just say this is it and I'm going to move on, uh, but over you know a course of a couple of months, it emerged uh, for me as the the only path forward because I I was I got pretty burned out uh, over my last month in the company and so it was uh, the only choice that sounded feasible to me. Um, and you know once a decision is made, suddenly you know there's a sense of relief I would say. Uh, but what I, what I really didn't anticipate was that, you know, after plunging into this void or darkness that follows, uh, that there's an incredible sense or there has been an incredible sense of grief, loss and mourning, uh, that followed. I honestly, I didn't expect that. It's only occurred to me once I talked to a few people about this, um, you know, it's been always six years, uh, and, uh, 
also six years of you know me constantly trying you know working to evolve and working to change and working to adjust as the company grew um it's an incredible mental and emotional roller coaster um and i think looking back it seems pretty human that it's just it's not just something you walk walk away from unscathed but i just didn't expect that you know the real impact of it um i since then i've spent many months processing everything that happened in six years uh both good and bad and getting all of this written down on paper i have my notebook here somewhere uh which is almost full um like i've actually wrote it on paper just sat down every day for a couple of for maybe minutes sometimes hours uh, to just write everything down uh, i ended up filling an entire notebook in it but it also was also an incredibly helpful and freeing exercise. And the other thing that helped me was, you know, finding a sense of community, just talking to other founders uh, who've been through the experience themselves. And since then, I've also found myself being in that seat, talking to other founders who are, you know, struggling with the, well, with a decision, with a potentially tough decision of whether they might be putting, you know, might need to put something behind themselves. Yeah, that's, uh... Oh, I feel a lot of similarities with deciding to sell Sifter and move on from there. The one thing that really stands out is deliberate reflection. And in my case, it was due diligence, right? Kind of forced mm -hmm. deliberate reflection and like, oh man, you know, you, you really think back on everything. And even running the business day to day, I feel like that's something we don't make enough time for. And as a result, kind of charge ahead through things instead of kind of stopping, hitting pause, stepping back, and then examining and giving it that deliberate thought, that time, that reflection, that, you know, the quiet time just helps clear your head. Mm, um, definitely. And in hindsight, that's something I feel like I never did enough. Um, and I, I have tried to work more into my schedule, um, but it's hard to stay calm and think through things like that when you're in the thick of it. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. I mean, I'm thankful I had the time to, you know, to spend on writing and just walking around a lot and just thinking things through. But yeah, you need to take the time for it. It's like initially it was there was a sense of like, well, you know, it's been a month or a couple of weeks. Like, isn't, you know, is the time for me to to have moved past everything? And then you figure out, well, you know, this experience of loss and grief, it never really you know, you never really move past it. It just sticks with you for, I don't know how long. It sticks with you for whatever you do next. It influences however you approach what you do next. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. Um, so on a less um, emotional note, the so the logistical challenges, uh, obviously WildBits Remote, we're familiar with that. Um, what kind of challenges did you all see most frequently? Um, what kind of things did you all do to solve that? And, um, well, yeah, really, that's it. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I've been thinking about this. I think uh, for any remote team, uh, a lot of it boils down to communication and finding ways to collaborate across time zones, you know, especially uh, when you uh, interact with people regularly who are on, say, you know, here in Berlin and then nine hours different uh, on, the Pacific, uh, on the Pacific West Coast. Um, there's meetings are really, really hard and challenging because there's only a very, very small window for meetings. And, you know, for people here, it might be the end of their day. Uh, they might already be completely tired. Uh, everyone else, you know, maybe on the West coast had to get up early. So they might equally not be at the top of their game yet. Um, and so as these things progressed, it was scheduling that in a group or getting that you know, right in a growing company was something I'm not sure I've ever, I've ever really figured out. Um, and so, you know, maybe we had too many meetings at the end. Uh, it's quite possible. Um, and didn't really experiment enough with, you know, alternative or say asynchronous means of communication. Mm -hmm. We started a few things, you know, uh, uh, you know, being more deliberate in how we, you know, make decisions and how we, you know, create proposals, you know, some like decision records, which, you know, is a different thing where you have something written down, which you can think yeah. about, uh, then, you know, comment on, um, 
it's uh, it was that was a good start, I think, uh, to have less meetings. But um, yeah, I don't think we've ever figured that out. There have been many upsides to you know building a remote company, uh, especially to the time zone distributions. We you know we rotated our uh, we set up our on-call rotation for engineers in a way that yeah. you know took took uh, the time zones into account, so that you know people could still maximize sleep uh, even when they were on call, which was pretty good, I thought. Um, you know, and customer support is obviously something that actually, that benefits greatly uh, from you know being spread out. It was also one of the reasons why we uh, why we initially why we started pushing more for remote was to serve our U.S. customers better. Uh, because we're a German business, mm -hmm. uh, initially, you know, a lot of the founders are in uh, Germany, and some of our early hires were also over here, or some people moved over here, and so we still have a, you know, this, we found ourselves with a large chunk of customers over there who we couldn't give a good enough experience. It's uh, yeah. pretty frustrating for customers when, uh, you know, they send you an email. Maybe they're on the U.S. East Coast. Maybe you get to respond to them before you before you head off for the day and then they have to wait an entire day until they get you know another response from you and it's just it's not a great experience and so this was one of the reasons why we started pushing for it yeah it, in a lot of ways <clears throat> mirrors i feel like kind of our experience we've i think for us one of the best things that's worked with remote interestingly is switching to four day weeks in that we've become very deliberate about meetings and we constantly mm -hmm. um, are juggling that in every meeting. It's like, do we need this meeting? How could we avoid this meeting? And kind of embracing the asynchronous nature for two reasons. One, the time zone. It obviously just mm -hmm. works better. And two, what we've found is with the asynchronous stuff, it allows people to do more of that focus work because you're yeah. not constantly... Um, in meetings and for the people on either end of the time zone spectrum they have a lot of quiet time where there's not a whole bunch of other people working now the poor people in the middle of the time zone they're getting bombarded in the morning and in the afternoon as people are mm -hmm. and so what we've really tried to do is focus on that asynchronous stuff more yeah. text-based things um base camp email uh, you know everybody always hates on email but it's such a good you know it lets people work and kind of check it on their own time instead of interrupting them or whatever. And so much of what we do is based on being able to focus and really get into deep thought. So uh, yes, it's interesting absolutely. to hear a lot of the same challenges. So I think uh, the, the, I think uh, continuously asking yourself the question of, you know, do we really need this meeting is a great thing that remote only fosters. I wish, well, I wish all companies would do that. It's not like I, you know, I loathe meetings. They, you know, well run and well purposed, they could be an incredible tool. But, uh, you know, continuously layering this question in your mind, is this meeting really necessary? Could we use a different medium to discuss this? Or, or fewer so actually, people. Or right. fewer people, it's a, that's it's right. It's shades yeah. of meetings. You don't have to completely yeah. ditch the meeting, but like, could we just three of us meet instead of 10 of us? Or um, We've yeah. found Basecamp's automatic check-ins too. That yeah. completely removed all of our stand-ups, all of our weekly and daily check-ins. We just do it via text and those reply to that and then everybody's automatically synced up. And then if we need a meeting, a few of us will make it happen um, instead of just yanking everybody into a meeting by default. Yeah. Um, I've, we, I've been thinking a lot about Slack in all of this or, you know, tools like Slack who, which in some ways I sometimes think have made remote work worse right? Uh, because there's this feeling of, uh, you know, the, the FOMO, the fear of missing out, the feeling of always having to be on. Uh, I think I've been thinking about, you know, what I would do different in, a, in another remote startup, and that would probably be to build it without Slack yeah. um, to, or to try and build it without Slack because I'm generally with you. It's like uh, I'm, I'm a fan of, you know, putting thought into what I write and, you know, where email comes in well. But, you know, for me, whether it's email or a Google Doc or any, you know, longer form method of communication, uh, it's just a lot more deliberate and generally more thoughtful than either a meeting or, you know, something very, very short lived as Slack. So, yeah, that was, I always found that a challenge and I'm, you know, I'm not sure Slack will ever figure out a way to solve that because right. Slack is, you know, built by a company that itself is not remote. 
or not, you know, neither remote nor distributed. And I keep keep wondering about the connections there. But we, you know, that's probably a, a material for an for an entirely different podcast episode. Yeah, so. yeah. We just took a week off Slack. We just nobody Ooh. used Slack for a whole week, and it was a little painful. Um, but it was just an experiment that really helped us be more thoughtful about how we use Slack. And we're like, these things we miss from Slack, and we can't think of replacements. These things we don't miss, and it should have shifted to Basecamp, either mm -hmm. pings or campfires or messages or whatever. And so we started shifting more and more to Basecamp and away from Slack. But Slack's still good for alerts or for customer success if they get a support request, and you still need to talk to the developers and need yeah. a, a way to live troubleshoot, that kind of thing. Um, yeah. So there's benefits, but yeah, you can't let Slack just kind of take over. You have to constantly rein it in and be deliberate about it. Um, Very true. <clears throat> so let's talk Germany. Oh yeah, my favorite um, topic. <laughs> everybody's starting companies all over the world. Um, there's things like Stripe Atlas, obviously, that help um, mitigate maybe some unique challenges of geographies or um, laws and that kind of thing. But my understanding has always been that Germany is one of the more challenging places um, to start a new business. So mm. for anybody else who's in Germany or um, thinking about that kind of stuff, is there any advice you have for that um, and kind of what you would do differently or things that you want to plan ahead for better just because it takes longer to deal with um, all that? Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that's an interesting one. And people generally assume when I'm in San Francisco, for example, by the way, which is also when I I experience the quiet end of the remote of the remote right. day <laughs> in the afternoon, which is pretty amazing. Um, so people always assume that you know when I was traveling to places that we you know Travis is on the on the U.S. West Coast or even somewhere in the Bay Area because it seems the natural place to be. Uh, and kind of are surprised when it's, you know, when I say that we're a German business and we're a truly German business, we, you know, we didn't create a, a UK limited as, you know, was, uh, in, you know, was pretty in vogue uh, for a while in Germany because it was a lot easier and there was a lot less capital that, that you needed to get started. Uh, so, you know, in Germany, if you, this one, one company structure, if you set that up, you'd need about 25,000 euros in starting capital. So, you know, there's, uh, from that, you can tell there's already a pretty high interest barrier. And yeah. so this is why people started, you know, creating, setting up limiteds in the UK. But thankfully, that's changed. Uh, Germany is still, even though it's well known for its efficiency and for, uh, you know, our, our joy uh, or our fondness of cues, uh, it's where Germany is still generally very slow when it comes to you know, the bureaucracy. If you compare setting up a business in Delaware or setting up a business through, you know, as you mentioned, Stripe Atlas, which probably takes you a day or two at most, or you don't have to, you don't have to do anything anymore. Yeah. Uh, you can just hire companies to do that. It just, it generally takes longer over here. Um, and so, um, yeah, it's. I think in the beginning it's that uh, over time as the company grows, you know, those challenges shift. Germany and Europe as a whole, you know, we obviously have very different, you know, employment laws. Mm -hmm. Once you reach a certain, you know, number of employees, you can't just, you know, uh, you can't just fire anyone uh, just for for any reason, you know, as you can in the U.S., where some states have, you know, at will uh, employment. Um, so, you know, there some people perceive these as uh, obstacles, I would say. And I just like, for me, they're just things I've always been used to them. They just so, are. Yeah. They're just there. They just yeah. are. They exist. And so you just deal with them. You know, it's like uh, building a business for me, it's never the intention to, uh, you know, to think about, you know, well, how could I effectively fire someone? My right. question is, well, how can I, you know, keep these great people in the company. Um, and so, I mean, you know, I would call these obstacles and for, uh, there's also that shops are not open here on Sundays, which is not related to a business, but yeah. so it, every expat who moves here from the U S is weirded out by that. But for yeah. us, it's just, you know, Germans, we, we like to take our time off work. Yeah. Um, I think the more challenging things as a company grows, 
they stem from the legal side of things. Uh, you know, German law is very different from U.S. law. I also have to say that German law, especially when it comes to uh, you know selling products or buying products, is very very customer friendly, which is what a especially U.S. Co companies don't understand. Uh, which makes sense because the U.S. law is just very different. You yeah. seek all the liability protection that you can. Unlimited indemnification for you know third party mm -hmm. and IP infringements and all that ridiculous stuff, um, and uh, you know rectifying that or putting pulling those strings together can be really really hard. Uh, sometimes we had legal negotiations that took up to a year just to because it was it was back and forth yeah. of you know we can't do this and uh, we can't do that. We're not a U.S. company, so we can't do that. And so uh, different, you know, U.S. enterprise companies in particular have very interesting requirements. And so there's a lot, just a lot of back and forth, lots yeah. of redlining and then removing red lines and then just lots of word documents. In the end, we've we've uh, we've we've had it work out most of the time. I think the key for us was to, you know, find good lawyers who have experience in, you know, international business. Um, who can just help navigate this and figure out, you know, where we can, uh, you know, where we can offset risk, you know, where we can take on more risk and where, you know, company, where our customers will, will need to take some risk. Cause I mean, that's all what it's all about really negotiating with enterprise companies. They only, their only goal is to reduce risk wherever they can. Yeah. And that for us means we have to take on more. And so you start taking out insurances and all of that. And so it's, you know, it's, it gets, it gets more relaxed over time, but it's still, uh, I think especially early on, it's just, it seems like this insurmountable, uh, you know, barrier or wall. But I think for us in the end, we found a good lawyer to help us do that. And then it would just worked out. And plus lawyers in Germany are a lot cheaper than they are in the U S. Uh, so that's an extra plus. Yeah. Interesting. But and the, the thing is, uh, you know, for us, you, or you might still need a U.S. presence if you, you know, like us, like Travis, want to expand it to the U.S., hire people there. You might still need to create, you know, a subsidiary or, you know, now using Stripe Atlas, you know, say like a company that exists for employment purposes or maybe you want to, uh, you know, even use it for sales. But I probably wouldn't recommend that because I'm pretty sure that's, that's a whole can of worms in terms of uh, uh, state and federal taxes in the U.S. that you might want to open. Um, but yeah, and U.S. presence can still be beneficial for different kinds of purposes. Yeah. Right on. So do you think with uh, like Stripe Atlas today, do you think you still would have uh, incorporated as a German business or gone the Stripe Atlas route? Mm, good question. I don't know. Uh, there are benefits to being a German business, yeah. basically. Uh, there are benefits to being protected, or also on our end, you know, under German law, uh, which is, by the way, you know, one of the generally contentious things, uh, you know, when we negotiated license when we negotiated license agreements with larger companies. It was laws under. Yeah, they want to move the court of law to New York, California, or wherever, or Delaware, uh, and we are just like, well, we can't do that. We're, or you know, they want to move it to the UK because it's closer and the court system is closer to the US. And so insisting on that was probably, it was basically the only thing, one of the few things probably where we said, we can't do that. This is a, this is non-negotiable. Here's why. And maybe we can, you know, connect you with a German lawyer to, uh, to explain to you why this is actually good for you, even though you might not think it is. And so. Enterprise so negotiations, like, I think are just, uh, the bane of the existence of anybody yeah. that's got to deal with that. It's true. I though I found like, you know, talking to uh, legal counsels in these companies is always a different story than, you know, when you just send back and forth red lines. Yeah. It's like you just I think it, in the end, it works out like any negotiation. You just figure out what's really important to them uh, or what, is, what are the most important things to them. And then you just figure out how you can, you know, inch a little bit closer to what they're after without, you know, setting up what might end up being an illegal contract under German law. So. Yeah. So let's move on to um, difficulties, mm -hmm. and uh, in particular, and I know previously you'd mentioned there's a lot, and it's tough to pick one. But what's the toughest day 
or just event, doesn't have to be it happened in a single day that you've encountered, um, either with Travis or just in general with business? Mm. Yeah, it's really hard to name just one uh, because. I don't know. I mean, you've been through the experience yourself. There are just so many unique challenges and obstacles uh, that you just don't even think about as you start out. You know, I was speaking for myself as an engineer, I never went, you know, and started a business with the idea of like, hey, I'm going to manage a company of 50 people at some point, someday. Yay! I look forward to it. And so you're, you just, you're suddenly faced with this challenge. It's like, oh, I have to learn how to be a manager. And so suddenly I have to learn how to be a manager of managers and eventually a manager of manager of managers. Yes, that's right. Um, and so, I don't know, the roller coaster, both emotional and mental just never stopped for me. So it's like, I can't even tell you potentially also, you know, for because of a, now a level of distance that I have where, you know, I think just the most, my most recent events maybe come into play. And it's just that the founder experience I found is one where, uh, things are just great one minute and 30 minutes later, everything's on fire. And somehow you still have to keep your calm, uh, to calm everyone else down. Um, and yeah, there are just so many events that left impressions on me, especially, the bad and the challenging ones, you know, like facing a, uh, while well, having to let someone go or, uh, just giving someone, well, feedback that is not pleasant to give, you know, these are things where you're just like, you never prepare for those things and they, they feel insurmountable once you get to them. Um, and they get easier over time. Uh, but I think the most challenging problems for me were always people problems. Um, but yeah, in terms of, you know, what my personally toughest day was, it was probably the one that I decided to leave. Um, even though that also wasn't, you know, as you said, it wasn't just one day. It was something that just built up over time, maybe weeks, maybe even month. Mm -hmm. uh, that is hard to accumulate or hard to sum up or, you know, point up, point to a particular day where this thing happened. So, but yeah. that's probably my most recent memory that I can bring in and, it, the way I would almost describe kind of what you're talking about is like we always, I say we, generally speaking, every company is so focused on growth. We want to grow, mm -hmm. grow, grow, grow. And everybody's focused on the benefits of growth and not, they're not, nobody's excited about growing so they can become a manager, right? Mm -hmm. Or start reading management books instead of development books. Um, but that's part and parcel with growth. Like, it's inevitable. And yeah. if you're anxious and excited about growth, you really have to embrace that your role, your responsibilities will evolve with that. And every ounce of growth is going to bring an ounce of discomfort as you adjust to the new situation, whatever that means, right? Growth mm -hmm. can mean scaling problems and not just scaling technically, but scaling a business and management. And I think in our maniacal pursuit of growth, we end up kind of saddling ourselves with burdens that we're not excited about. And mm -hmm. I think it's useful to, um, and that's one of the reasons to me that bootstrapping is so attractive is because the growth's a little more steady and not crazy. And so yeah. it lets you handle those challenges in a more calm, controlled manner instead of just constantly. But at the same time, Travis, Travis's growth was pretty like, it's not like y'all tried to grow. It just happened, right? I mean, y'all just, mm -hmm. everybody embraced it. Um, obviously, the open source support um, garnered a lot of respect and interest. And so, um, yeah, I mean, you could just talk a little bit about that growth curve and um, yeah. how that affected y'all and, and played out internally. I think there's, there's one thing I just wanted to, to loop back on. Yeah. As you said, you know, you talked about growth and I think personal growth and, you know, what it, you know, the strain it puts on you is definitely something that is rarely talked about, you know, especially when you move into a position uh, or, you know, have to take on responsibilities like management that, you know, you were never thought of and you suddenly have to learn a lot faster than would be, you know, normal, I would say, you know, say you're in a normal environment or in a large company and you progress from, 
you know, say being an engineer, you take on a little bit more tech responsibility. And over time, you move into management if it's a good path for you, if you enjoy, do, you know, working with people. Um, and, you know, as founders, even though, you know, Travis was bootstrapped, it, you know, it ended up growing relatively quickly, at least for, you know, what I was comfortable with. And so there's definitely these responsibilities that you have to take on where you have to, you know, like grow up a lot faster than would be normal. And then everyone around you and you have to grow up only to then, you know, teach others what you've learned and basically let go of uh, what you've just grown into and suddenly be, you know, already focused on being something else or yeah. someone else. So that part is really challenging, I find. I mean, just don't get me wrong. Now, I actually enjoy management. It's basically the thing that I now focus on. So it's uh, it was a challenge or a, a progression that was worth my while, at least. So, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, growth. Um, when we set out, we didn't really have a master plan. Uh, you know, Travis started out as a bit of a hobby project that was first an open source project that was community maintained, community run, and then a company was built around it. Uh, we built a product that we started selling. And so, uh, you know, you already mentioned the open source site. You know, Travis uh, provides, you know, free uh, continuous integration infrastructures to open source projects. And that was probably one of the most important things for our growth, because even though we didn't intend it to be, it turned out to be marketing uh, where we considered it as something that, you know, we do as good for the community. So I think it's something that, you know, turned out to be a coin with two sides and both are val incredibly valuable and they're incredibly useful. But uh, the marketing side only emerged over time while we wanted to just focus on, you know, being a, a force of good in the open source community. I think that's one of the things that of all my observations the last few years that has me most excited is the traditional view of marketing is everybody hates it. <clears throat> it's evil. It's bad. Um, but it doesn't have to be, right? And the way mm -hmm. I've started to divide it is there's marketing that's focused on the company doing the marketing, and there's the marketing that's focused on the people using the products. Mm -hmm. and so to me, open source, um, wherever the company falls on that spectrum, is marketing that's about the users, right? Like, Travis started from the users and then a business accidentally grew out of it almost. Mm -hmm. That's uh, right. Mike Parham's work uh, with Sidekick is another great example. Mm -hmm. And in so many ways, people are really uncomfortable. Oh, if I open source my business, somebody else is going to, you know, take it and start a business exactly like mine. Like nobody, yeah. can, nobody can do that, right? If you are the only one that's passionate enough about your open source project, it's going to be discourse, obviously, is another one, uh, mm -hmm. right? They're open source. Um, and so there's plenty of businesses that can be built this way. And I love it because at the core, it's about here it is, it's, it's for you. We're building it for you. But then at the same time, we're going to build a business around it. Um, kind of like one of my favorite Walt Disney quotes, we don't make movies to make money. We make money to make more movies. Mm. <laughs> and <laughs> that's I, right. I feel like the open source model is a very pure way of approaching that to where you're making money to feed it back into the product. People don't have to use your, your service, but um, I feel like there's a level there. And supporting the open source community by providing it for free, it's the same thing. It's about the people, not about Travis. And that is what inherently makes it good marketing because it's genuine. It's not branding and all the traditional things. Um, and it's easier said than done, but it's something for people, I think, that's useful for people to think about as they're getting started, where they want to be on that spectrum for marketing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, you know, I, uh, I consider this as marketing and, uh, in, in a good way, but I also look at it from, uh, the market perspective because now it's become the standard for people to think, you know, they have to offer something for free to open source projects. And I could, I in general, I think that's a good thing. Yeah. Um, it's just, you know, suddenly you might have to do to make this investment very early on, you know, like offer, provide free infrastructure where you're not sure if you're going to see a return yeah. on this for maybe, I don't, I don't know how long. Yeah. Uh, and so, um, I've been torn on this for a while. Uh, but on the other hand, I also can't complain about it because it's worked well for us and it's, uh, you know, the open source involvement and 
uh, turning Travis into something that you know is just a very widely used in the open source community on GitHub has definitely helped us even you know take this next step into large companies who you know came to us you know as you just said they came to us from the user perspective where the d developers in these companies you know asked to be able to use you know Travis in their companies and so yeah. we suddenly from that even evolved you know an, an enterprise product and sales channel for us that was also gave us a a very different growth trajectory, I would say, because you know you spend a lot more time, as I mentioned earlier, you spend a lot more time in the sales process and also in account management and things like that, just continuously holding hands, keeping these relationships going, uh, signing up for a new procurement system with the same company every year. Um, <laughs> but you know the returns are exponentially higher there. You know if you sell. You know, I always like to think of the Happy Gilmore big checks because companies right. did send us actual checks, even though they're not a thing here in Germany anymore. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the checks are just, you know, exponentially bigger that you can that you get out of these kinds of customers. And so uh, it was interesting to see how, you know, the open source side, you know, this marketing uh, or the, the positioning there, um, you know, eventually helped us go after, you know, sell to larger companies. And, yeah. Well, it's it's easy to focus on um, the marketing side and how it paid off, but I'm sure on the uh, internal operation side, scaling to support all of that growth was probably no trivial task either. No, it was not. <laughs> I <laughs> think we could probably leave it at that. Yes. Um, yeah. Because that kind of growth surely creates a lot of strain in and of itself. Um, so it's worth acknowledging that it's not all unicorns and rainbows. This is true. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, based on all this work that you've done, um, you know, if you started another business or, you know, as you're advising other um, clients, uh, based on all your lessons learned, what would you advise people to do that may be different than the decisions you originally made? Um, and, you know, what, what topics would you advise them to really focus on and invest in up front uh, and things like that? Hmm. I think focus is a good word because that's what I find uh, that in my experience is a really hard thing to to get right. Focusing on, you know, very few things and doing those really well and basically seeing them through. I think in startup speak, you know, that's generally called executing. Um, though that's also a fluffy word. Uh, but, you know, figuring out what the thing is you want to focus on and then seeing that through without, you know, without letting getting you letting yourself get distracted by other shiny things uh i've been finding that challenging myself and i also see this a lot in startups you know it starts with uh you know not being able to or view the question of who's my audience like who am i actually selling this to what is my product what is my product what is the value i provide um and then uh there's just so many layers there where uh it's very easy to get distracted. And this is probably one of the key pieces of advice I would give myself. It's just, you know, focus on very, very few things and focus on them, focus on getting, seeing them through. Uh, until, of course, you learn that what you're building is, turns out not to be the right thing anymore. Uh, you know, not basically go completely blind, but um, just not letting yourself get distracted along the way unless it's really necessary. So, that's definitely one thing, relentlessly prioritizing, prioritizing uh, and just, you know, focusing on a few things and doing those really well. I think uh, the other thing that, you know, I, I've learned for myself is that you know, diversity is not really a just uh, it's a requirement, mm -hmm. not just it's not just an option. And uh, the founders team uh, needs to reflect that to begin with, uh, which sets any company up for. You know, my experience now a much better trajectory uh, when it comes to, you know, building a diverse team. Um, and I think in general, uh, just paying more attention to the human side of things, especially, you know, if, when you come uh, as, you know, a group of engineers come together, it's uh, it's easy to forget, you know, that it's a, there's a relationship that you build and that so there's a relationship that you build with everyone who comes into your company, the relationships that you build with your customers um, and especially in the early stages, it's, it's easy to forget about this because you're just so focused on getting something out the door or, you know, so, you know, getting that customer to give you their credit card and 
think it pays to invest time and also maybe a little bit of money there early on and you know getting a coach either for yourself or the founders team or like a moderator facilitator um or you know just external perspective or advisors something uh, i also wish we would have gotten or i would have you know resorted to sooner just you know getting getting more external perspective into things and so the last thing is probably just taking care of yourself uh you know uh, also again it comes back to the human side but also the usual things of not you know working too much longer than necessary i think we do we both know that especially in the early stages uh it's easier said than done to just say i'm going to work eight hours a day when everything's on fire and there's no one else to put them out i think i remember you talking you know early uh at a talk years ago you know because stepping on a plane with no one else to look after sifter and then just being like oh my god what's going to happen and this you know i had this also i had the same feeling and it was every weekend as i went shopping yeah. even and um but yeah just taking care of yourself you know finding maybe even a therapist early on and just or working with a coach uh from the very early stages uh is definitely something i would recommend that budget can you know putting budget into that can pay off many fold yeah absolutely the the two things that really so that's one of the things that really stands out and i've told myself and wild bit's so great i'm like i don't know if i'm ever going to want to start another business um but that if i did it would very much be uh you know, four day weeks and that's that. And you start that way and you learn to get done what you can get done and embrace mm. it. And you use those three days to fully recharge. So your longer weekends and then you come in Monday recharge and you just force yourself to do it and build the business that way in an intentional, deliberate way. That's not so dependent on you by yeah. buyers seven days a week. Um, because you might move a little slower in the beginning, but you're going to be able to last longer and, you know, not drive yourself crazy and uh, burn out, which yeah. you know, it's, it's easy to ignore burnout early on, but it's inevitable if you don't kind of embrace a healthy balance from the beginning. Yep. Um, Agreed. And the other is the diversity aspect. It's so easy in the beginning to just hire the people around you. Yeah. And it feels comfortable because everybody agrees because everybody's got the same background and the same. Mm -hmm. And to me, the more I pay attention to all the diversity aspects, you, the discomfort that comes from diversity is where the value lies, right? And people, mm -hmm. it's not just a bunch of people all saying yes to each other and blindly charging forward. It's somebody be like, whoa, 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 hold on. This is a terrible idea. Here's why. And you're like, oh, wow, I never had that experience, you know? So yeah. those two angles, um, if there's anything I've felt, I figured out um, in the last few years, it's the value of those two things, um, especially in the early days and getting started, not just, you know, building a team of the people who are immediately around you um, yeah. and taking care of yourself. Um, so on the last, I guess, bit here, um, if you were starting something new today, would you still do the same kind of thing? Are there other things floating around in your head that you see are more exciting or more challenging based on your experience? Um, you know, what would you do? This is a good question. I think the thought of starting something right now is something that uh, is almost scary to me. Uh, so it's, it's also a hard thing to think about. I'm right there but with you. I think <laughs> the, the things that I keep coming back to is, you know, looking at, you know, different kind of business problems, I would say. You know, there is a, a multitude of processes for, you know, in small, medium, or even enterprise businesses that are currently done in tedious or manual or just more inefficient ways. And so I find the, the most interesting problems are really, you know, what you could call, you know, the, <clears throat> the boring business problems, uh, but where there's a lot of potential to actually, you know, help teams or business to be more efficient or you know also productive in in their in their work and so i find myself gravitating a lot towards those uh but you know even the larger the company the larger the business and the larger the problem or even the smaller problems there uh it's all about you know what is it a small problem that you can solve but that has really that can have like really big impact for for these kinds of companies you know like say you have a company that makes a couple of billion a year and they spend 
a hundred million doing something, uh, or maybe they lose money somewhere because of some sort of process and they spend, you know, they, there's a benefit for them to gain hundred million more revenue. And somehow you build a tool that somehow enables that. Right. And the, or even just to re, you know, give them a couple, you know, a couple percent of those hundred million back. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, I don't know. My excitement in the last couple of months has been about those problems. Uh, but whether that means anything, I'm not sure. Yeah, <laughs> I'm yeah. still trying to figure that out. I, I think I've been similarly fascinated by a lot of that stuff. The operational things where people are using spreadsheets for really clunky mm -hmm. processes that just don't scale and don't work. And it's just because it works well enough and they haven't, you know, taken the time to commit and say, how could we fix this? Because there's other fires to put out. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I feel like those are some, there's some really fascinating opportunities there for the really boring things. That yeah. companies just do out of habit. Yeah. I think the other thing I've been thinking about is, you know, building something for, you know, remote teams, uh, for remote companies and something that might also in the end benefit, you know, non-remote companies, because I always like to say, you know, remote work practices or distributed team practices, they don't just benefit companies who are remote and distributed. I think they can benefit any company. Uh, because there you put a lot more discipline and effort into communicating well, documenting and all those kinds of right. things. And so I've also been thinking about those. Yeah. No, I mean, those, I would say that echoes very similarly with uh, things that have been on my mind. I think it's the nature of a remote work company and kind of starting to become more deliberate and thoughtful about how work is getting done. Yeah. Uh, kind of pulls you towards those areas for sure. Cool. All right. Well, any last words of advice, parting words of wisdom for somebody else who wants to start a, a new business, new entity? Whew. I, I think I've already, <laughs> uh, I've already gone through most of them. Yeah. I think the, there's like another very businessy thing that I, uh, I've learned over the years and it's just to, to spend a lot of time experimenting with pricing. Uh, yeah. might be a, weird, a strange thing to end, uh, a strange note to end on, but it's like, I, I used to keep forgetting, and I see the same in other companies, that pricing is the number one var variable that you have mm -hmm. to increase your revenue. Uh, and there's so much room to play with it. Um, that's it. I think that's an incredible bit of advice. Uh, because, as generally speaking, it feels like most people come from more of a product background, right? We're mm -hmm. more focused on building a product. And we are for whatever reason, inherently terrible at valuing our own products. And yes. it feels uncomfortable to raise prices um, or charge more or what have you. But if, you know, say you charge $5 for something because you're uncomfortable and then you double it to $10, but people are willing to pay 20, you just doubled your revenue and your customers are still thrilled. Right. Yeah, I mean, you, right. you want, you want to make sure people are covered and, your existing customers, unless you're going to go out of business, you don't want to yank your existing customers into the new pricing. Um, so you can always experiment with pricing on your new customers to see, to find out what are people comfortable with. Um, but the idea, you know, in theory, you could double your revenue and have your, just as happy of customers. And yes, exactly. With just by changing a constant in your source code, right? Like, um, so yeah, I think that's a great piece of advice. It's hard. It's, it's, it's difficult for people to think about and embrace, but I think that's a really important variable and dial you can turn for the business. So yep, cool. Very much agreed. Right on. Well, thanks for doing this. Uh, we covered a lot of awesome ground. Uh, so yeah, thanks. Thank you for having me. It was yeah, a pleasure. Of course.